So uh, this talk is supposed to be an introduction to ZK Snarks. I will start with a general problem setting, then uh, try to explain what zero knowledge is, and then give a quick walkthrough of ZK Snarks. So um, ZK Snarks are important, especially for blockchains, uh, in, in two aspects. Uh, the first aspect is that blockchains scale much better if they only do, if they only verify a computation instead of actually doing the computation. So uh, we'll see later what that actually means. And the great thing about CK Snarks is that the the verification is magnitudes faster than the actual computation of CK Snarks. The downside again is that CK Snarks themselves themselves add an overhead, but uh, we'll hope that. Uh, this balances out so that they can actually be a scaling solution in the future. Um, then the second aspect is that in blockchains everything is public. All you send to a blockchain is readable by uh, the whole world. And uh, CK Snarks help there because they add a property that is called zero knowledge. Um, okay, let's start explaining what zero knowledge is. Or more importantly, so Zero knowledge is a, uh, an aspect of uh, that, or a, a notion that was defined in the area of interactive protocols. And in an interactive protocol, you always have, so you have two parties, a prover and a verifier, and the prover wants to, <laughs> so, so I, so, this is a quite small room, and I think it's very important uh, to get a very high quality recording of these talks, so please don't do this stuff with the lights. Uh, sorry for the technical, so we, we are fixing, uh, just one moment please. Okay, in interactive protocols, you always have two parties, the prover and the verifier, and the prover wants to convince the verifier about a certain fact. And, uh, and it has, this protocol has the property of zero knowledge. If the prover can convince the verifier that the fact is true, but without verifying any detail about why it is true. This sounds really weird, and I hope uh, the examples on the next slides will clarify us. And Examples of such statements are that uh, a given message is a valid transaction in a blockchain, or more abstractly, there is a W such that a f of x comma w is y for a fixed function f. Um, but let's take a more specific example, and so one would be a mini Sudoku board is solvable. So what is mini Sudoku? You probably know the regular nine times nine Sudoku, and to fit it into the presentation, I will, I will talk about a smaller version, a four times four Sudoku, but which is uh, the same thing in the end. So you have a board with four times four cells, and some of these cells are pre-filled with numbers between one and four, uh, but not all of them. And the task is to fill all the remaining cells in a way such that in each row there is exactly, so that one of the numbers between one and four appears exactly once in each row, it appears exactly once in each column, and it appears exactly once in each of the two times two, in each of the four two times two subsquares. Um, and so, of course, the, the, the regular Sudoku games, it's always clear that it's solvable, the question is how. But in this setting, we want to, so the, the prover, wants to convince the verifier uh, that the board is solvable without telling anything about how the, so the, the solution looks like. And uh, in the general setting, you would also consider boards which are not solvable. And then, of course, the prover cannot convince the verifier that it's not solvable. So this only works in the positive case. And uh, it is important to note that the protocol we will see next, uh, the size of the puzzle is irrelevant for the protocol. It works for nine times nine or for 1,000 times 1,000 boards. And uh, the only things we need are a table, 
a sheet of paper and a pen, and then an opaque uh, sticky tape and a dice. Okay, and so it starts, so of course the prover has the secret solution to the puzzle, it looks like that. And um, what the, the, the first step, what the prover does is uh, she shovels, shuffles the numbers, so uses the dice to create a replacement of the numbers. So she doesn't, it, she doesn't move the numbers on the board, but she replaces each number by a different one. So each one is replaced by a three, each two is replaced by a four, each three by a, by a two, and each four by a one. And uh, this is how the shuffled solution looks like now, and I also uh, added the replacement here. And because of the specific properties of the Sudoku problem, the shuffled solution is still a solution. So uh, you still have each of the numbers exactly once in each row, exactly once in, once in each, col each column, and exactly once in each subsquare. Uh, but it does not, doesn't necessarily fit anymore to this initial setting of the pre-filled uh, cells. Um, now, the next thing that happens is that uh, the, the prover writes the shuffled puzzle on a piece of paper and covers each cell individually with a piece of sticky tape. And then the prover puts the, uh, the, the paper on the table for the, uh, for the verifier to see. And now it's the verifier's turn. Uh, okay, that's, that's how it looks like now. Everything is covered. So all the, both the, the cells and the replacement is covered with tape. Now, the verifier has the following choices. She can either ask the prover to reveal a certain row, reveal a certain column, reveal a certain subsquare, or reveal the initially filled cells from the initial uh, um, setting and the shuffling. So let's assume she chooses to see the initially filled cells, then the prover will just peel off the sticky tape from the, from the cells from the initial solution and from the substitution, from the shuffling, and the verifier will check that this matches the initially given problem setting. So she looks at the, at the problem setting here on the right. For example, the, on the, in the top uh, row, there's a three. She looks at the replacement and the shuffling, sees that, she's uh, that the three is replaced by two, looks at the cell in the, in the partially covered uh, table and sees that, that there's a two, so that, that matches. And she does that for all the cells in the initial problem setting. Okay, and uh, what, what just happened? So um, the prover revealed parts of the, revealed the shuffling, right? Doesn't that reveal any information? I mean, the, the shuffling is, the, the prover chose that in secret, but it's not part of the solution, so that's, that's totally fine. And all the initial cells, I mean, there's nothing to be learned there, right? So uh, no private information was shared in this, in this turn. Um, and now the, this, these steps one to five are repeated multiple times. And the one very important thing here is that the prover always has to find a completely random shuffling in each round. Uh, if the prover uses the same shuffling and the verifier knows the fact, then information can be revealed. So, uh, yes, and only if you choose a new shuffling in each round, you achieve zero knowledge. So let's do a second round. Um, we have a newly shuffled board with a newly randomly chosen shuffling, and cover that again, put it on the table, and now the verifier again has these choices. She chooses to, she wants to see column two. So the prover uh, peels off the sticky tape from column two, but does not peel off the sticky tape from the, from the shuffling. That's very important. And uh, now the, what the prover does, uh, what the verifier does is she checks that uh, each of the numbers one to four appears exactly once in this column, because that's the property we want to have. And now you might say, okay, the prover just revealed the numbers in the solution, so uh, some private information was revealed, but that's actually not the fact. Uh, because the, this replacement was completely random. Any replacement has equal probability, and each replacement actually uh, corresponds to a permutation of this, uh, um, of this column here. So every, every correct solution inside this column is equally likely. So no, uh, not a single bit of private information was revealed here. 
And uh, yeah, so, and if you repeat this multiple times, then uh, the prover cannot cheat, or at least it becomes less and less likely for the prover to cheat because uh, the verifier doesn't check everything. She only checks a certain part of the solution in each round, but uh, there's always a certain probability that she will find the error and this, the, the overall chance of success in cheating, of course, decreases exponentially with the number of rounds. Um, and the, the important thing that happened here is why this works is that the prover actually writes the numbers on the paper, covers it with, it, it with, tape, with tape, so it's impossible to change the numbers after the verifier has made her decision what to see. And that's basically the, uh, the way we, why this protocol works. Um, okay, this was mini Sudoku. And from this example, we want to go to CK Snarks. Um, mini Sudoku still has uh, lots of problems. It's not a really nicely usable protocol. And the first problem is that it doesn't use, it doesn't work for generic computation. It just works for these Sudoku boards. But that's actually not true. So um, you can you can take a, an arbitrary problem in computation and transform that into the Sudoku problem. So this is called a reduction. Or you could also just see it as uh, it, you have a solution written in one programming language and uh, you take a compiler and compile it into a machine language. This is also, this, th I mean, this is done all the time. This is just, these problems just look a little less than computers, but they can actually encode all these uh, problems you could think of. So this is a solved problem. Um, it takes a lot of engineering work to make that efficient, that takes for granted, but the general problem is, is solved. So, uh, but what is actually more, uh, yeah, more problematic is that Mini Sudoku takes many rounds of, of interaction. And this is especially problematic for a blockchain where we want to create a transaction, send it to the blockchain, and the blockchain should verify it and then, uh, yeah, be done with it instead of having all these rounds of interactions. And especially um, the verifier is a person separate from the blockchain that has to use their own randomness and that would also not work in a blockchain context. So we have to reduce the rounds of interaction and at the best reduce it to only one. And the reason why we have this many interactions is that because uh, a single tiny error could be hidden in any cell of this uh, Sudoku board. And if there is a single error, then the whole solution is wrong. So we have to do these many rounds to increase the likelihood of actually finding this, this tiny error that is hidden in a single cell. Um, but if we take a different problem that does not have this, uh, this if we have a, take a, a different game that doesn't have this, this uh, problem, then, uh, okay, let me start again. <laughs> um, so we have to find a different game that doesn't have this problem. So we have to find a, a setting where a single error is visible almost everywhere. And uh, polynomials have this property. So um, if you change a polynomial in a, in a, in a single place, then this will usually change the full polynomial. So take a look at uh, this polynomial here. This is the graph. And now let's change this 2x to the 4 into a 1x to the 4. And we will get this graph here. And you see it's different at almost every point. And uh, there's, of course, a theorem that says that two different polynomials of degree up to n can coincide in at most n points. So um, and of course, this the, we we take polynomials that are low degree. I mean, it can still be quite high degree, but uh, the degree is usually tiny compared to uh, the number of points we can evaluate the polynomial at. So, uh, and with that, we get the we get the um, the error probability uh, to a point where it's negligible. Okay, how do SNARKs now uh, work? How do they use these polynomials? Um, we use, yeah, special polynomial equations. 
um, where a prover knows a secret polynomial W such that for all x, A of x times W of x equals B of x times C of x. This is simplification. Usually you have multiple polynomials and you have to have a way to choose a selection of polynomials according to some rules, but I would like to keep it simple here and just take a single polynomial. Um, so W is the secret solution that is only known to the, to the prover and the prover wants to convince the verifier that she knows this solution. Um, oh yeah. So, and what happens now is that the verifier chooses a secret evaluation point uh, to check that these polynomials are uh, equal, that this polynomial equation holds, and asks the prover to evaluate the secret polynomials, and you already see that this doesn't really work. So the verifier has a secret point, the prover has a secret polynomial, so, and they both don't want to reveal uh, their secrets, so uh, we have to add another tool, and this is homomorphic encryption. Um, homomorphic encryption, yeah, and then, so they use homomorphic encryption, some magic happens, and then the verifier can check whether the two polynomials are equal or not. So what is homomorphic encryption? Uh, it, allows, it allows you to perform computations on encrypted data. So you have a, a known function, a known program, but you don't know the inputs, they are encrypted some way. You perform the computation, and the result is the encrypted version of the, uh, of the result. Um, this does not yet work for arbitrary computations, but uh, so there is theoretical work that allows that, but it's not really practical yet. Uh, but we have uh, a tool called pairings, which can do it up to a certain point, and this point is arbitrary sums and a single multiplication at the end. Um, so a of x times w of x is a single uh, multiplication, um, so it, it works fine until you take a closer look and see that we actually have m more than one multiplication here because x is taken to certain powers inside the polynomial. Um, but this can be worked around by uh, taking a look at this separate for each power of x. Um, yeah, so you encrypt x, so you take x to the k and encrypt that, and then perform the addition inside the polynomial and the multiplication here at the end. Um, yeah, and this allows the prover to evaluate a polynomial at a unknown or encrypted point, and thus the verifier can check uh, the, that the polynomials are equal, or whether they are equal. Okay, um, we now reduce this whole thing to a two-round protocol. The prover claims something, the verifier chooses a circuit point, prover evaluates the polynomial, verifier checks that they are equal. Um, but uh, we would like to reduce that even further, and here is where this uh, thing called trusted setup uh, comes into play. Uh, the way it works is, okay, um, yes, that's what I just said, sorry, um, a bit out of sync with the slides. Um, if you take a look at the, the procedure here, you see that uh, we don't really need to go from the encrypted form to the decrypted form in the end again, we can just check equality on the encrypted form. So if, if the encrypted version of X equals the encrypted version of X, then X equals X. Uh, yeah. Um, so, what we actually, what we what we don't actually need is the uh, is the decrypted version of X. So this initial X that got encrypted, then sent to the prover, and the prover evaluates the polynomial. We don't need this initial version anymore. We only need it once to encrypt it. And this is what the, what the trusted setup uh, does. And especially if nobody knows the non-encrypted version of X at any point, then we can actually reuse the encrypted version of X all the time. We just have to generate it once. And this is exactly what the uh, trusted setup does. Um, we generate an encrypted version of X in a distributed process. Uh, in a simplified way, you can think of that like, so, and why, why do we want it to be distributed? Because um, we want to share the responsibility among multiple persons. So we want to, um, if anyone publishes this decrypted version of X, then we can create fake proofs. And uh, if we do it in a way that um, the 
encrypted version of X is a, a combined version of uh, the, the secrets of all participants, then we require all participants to uh, publish their secrets in order to, uh, for it to, to be broken. So, um, yeah, that's how the trusted setup works. Um, yes, and this is the, so these secret numbers uh, generated by the, the participants of this setup is also called the toxic waste because they should not ever publish it. They should just destroy it. Okay, do I have time for a quick wrap up? Um, so we have the trusted setup that it generates a reusable encrypted evaluation point. The prover evaluates the polynomials at this uh, encrypted point using homomorphic encryption, using pairings then verifier checks that the numbers are equal in an encrypted form. This is all quite simplified. Uh, I hope the next talks will go into depth there more. And zero knowledge, oh yeah, right. We didn't talk about zero knowledge. Um, this is actually, <laughs> I mean, the, the interesting point about snarks is actually not that they allow zero knowledge, it's, it's that they allow this uh, speed up in verification and uh, people, People find zero knowledge more interesting because it's kind of counterintuitive, but actually it's, it's a triviality to add to the protocol here. So the protocol works, uh, so most of the work in the protocol uh, is to, uh, yeah, allows the speed up and the zero knowledge just basically comes for free. And this is how it comes to, for free. Um, uh, the prover just adds a random encrypted number to both sides of the equation. And because it's all encrypted, uh, there's no way for the prover uh, to cheat there, and that's how you get zero knowledge. And the proof itself is eight group elements in an elliptic curve. Uh, the verifying uh, is five pairing checks plus some elliptic curve arithmetics. And I'm way out of time now, so thanks for your attention.